until Thursday morning, I was planning to revise and re-preach an old sermon that dealt with the fascinatingly gruesome cannibalistic imagery that Jesus employed in the gospel reading tonight when he talks about our need to eat his flesh and drink his blood if we are to have eternal life. It's so bizarre and confronting that it's hard to hear it in our worship service without talking about it. Um, so now that I'm not going to talk about it, I will provide a link to that previous sermon in the online version of this one so that you can go and read it if you need to grapple with what on earth that was all about. What I do want to preach on tonight will not be nearly as weird or confronting, but it's something I don't think I've ever preached on before, and I hope it will still be helpful. I want to preach about singing together in worship. Our reading from the letter to the Ephesians exhorted us to be filled with the Holy Spirit as we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among ourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in our hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all time and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So on Thursday morning, I read a little piece in the media about the kinds of music that are played to you when you are stuck on hold waiting for someone to take your phone call. And that sparked off a hundred thoughts about the ways that music is used and abused and about what that might mean for the way that we sing together in worship. And of course, for us in this congregation, that is changed again by the fact that we now gather to worship online. Singing is a very physical thing, but we are no longer physically together as we seek to sing together. I'll come back to that. There's probably no one who is completely immune to the power of music to evoke our memories and impact our emotions. Even people who are deaf can often feel music in their bodies and be moved by it. And this article that I read suggested that companies can and do make choices about their on-hold music in order, order to either increase the likelihood of people waiting patiently or deter them from waiting and make them want to hang up. Hello, Centrelink, Telstra and insurance company claim lines. There are really obvious things like choosing music that is calming and pleasant versus music that is annoying and agitating. But there is also things like having music that goes on continuously without beginning or end so that people on hold can't start thinking, I've been here for six songs already. The article went on to comment on how a restaurant might play more upbeat music to prevent people from relaxing too much and to keep them moving to make way for the next sitting. Or a supermarket might use music that encourages people to linger and end up buying more. And public toilets might use insidiously repetitive music that would make it unbearable for a homeless person to consider locking themselves in and sleeping there for the night. Now, none of that is about us singing together, but it does shine a little light on the ways that music can affect our emotions and behaviours. The article acknowledged that this manipulative intent is far from an exact science because everyone's music tastes are different. So what soothes one person may annoy others. I've also heard it said that the music that most appeals to people and has an instant impact on their feelings is the music they were into when they were 17. There have even been studies on the therapeutic power of music with people in advanced states of dementia. And it seems to be the music that they most loved in their late teens that most reopens temporary bridges of coherent conversation which is an important reminder that these people have not lost their mind, as is too often said. They are still all there, but the bridges of communication and connection have become harder to find. Lots of aged care chaplains report on how particular classic hymns, Amazing Grace being the most often cited, can awaken a room full of people who previously seemed distant and lost in their own inner worlds. 
Music therapy has become a whole specialist branch of healthcare, not only in dementia care and palliative care, but in all sorts of healthcare. When it comes to singing together with others, there are quite a few of us in this congregation who are quite passionately involved in it. Ian sings in the chorus of major opera productions and in the Essendon Choral Society. Acacia's live theatre work includes a particular passion for musical theatre. James is married to a prominent choir director in the Melbourne gospel music scene. Samara, Shelley, Margie and Glenis all sing in community choirs. I don't think John does anymore, but he did. And there's sure to be a few of you that I've missed. A brief online search would find you any amount of social science analysis of the powerful benefits of singing together in choirs. It has measurable impacts on both physical and mental well-being. And it's that sense of euphoric well-being on top of the fact that it's just good fun that keeps people coming back to these choirs. Singing together in churches has always been part of this same phenomenon. Apart from any spiritual benefits, churches have been places that have launched many great musical careers. It's no accident that many of the world's greatest and most loved singers first learned to sing growing up in churches. But singing together is not just about sounding good and feeling good. And as we edge closer to the specific question of the role of singing together in worship, it's worth noting how singing can bind us together in a strong sense of unity and group identity. If you watched much of the Olympic Games, you'll have noticed the significance of singing national anthems during the medal ceremonies. Most Australians are not even big fans of our national anthem, but we still get caught up in the emotion of it as Jess Fox or Ariane Titmus get yet another gold medal draped around their necks and we all feel joyously united as proud Aussies. The singing helps bind us together. You might have also observed how important singing the club song is in footy club culture. It's seldom the height of musicality, except in some of the Pacific Islander rugby clubs, but it's an important ritual that binds the team together in a powerful sense of common identity and common purpose. This sense of common identity and common purpose is hugely significant in more important contexts too. The community singing of South African freedom songs helped bring down apartheid. It was important in the freedom struggle in Timor-Leste too, and Shelley has been sharing some clips of our friends there singing for us recently. Without the singing of Palestinian freedom songs, the Palestinian people may well have been obliterated by the brutal oppression that they have endured for decades. Listen to the choirs of any of the many Burmese churches in our Baptist Union, and you'll understand a little more of how they survived as strong communities amidst the horrors that have been perpetrated against them and their home country. Oppressive regimes around the world have often moved swiftly to lock up or eliminate the poets and folk singers because they recognize the crucial role they play in keeping hope alive and resistance strong. All of these things inform and contribute to what is going on when we gather to sing together in church. When we gather to, in the words of our reading, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among ourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in our hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. A few preachers and biblical scholars have tried to make distinctions between these three things, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Most, though, have concluded that there's really nothing in that idea. The writer to the Ephesians has quite the habit of piling up synonyms. Why use one word when you can use three? And these exact three words occur frequently and interchangeably in the titles in the Greek version of the book of Psalms that was in use in the first century. 
An almost identical verse can be found in the letter to the Colossians, where it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. So that one reminds us that singing together is linked to teaching one another. And there's no doubt that singing helps embed words and ideas into our minds. Those of you who are around back when we first switched from speaking the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed in unison to singing them together will probably remember that many of us went from needing to read the words to knowing them by heart in just a few weeks. Some of you will remember our Muslim friend, Noor, who was a Hafiz, which means that he had memorized the entire Quran. Now, it doesn't make it any less extraordinary, but Noor would be the first to admit that every Hafiz does that by learning to sing it, not speak it. And many of you know the experience of hearing a song that you haven't heard for decades and finding that you still know all the words. Malady creates the hooks that embed the words in our minds. The early Baptists 400 years ago were very aware of this, and initially they were opposed to singing anything other than psalms and biblical texts because they wanted nothing but scripture to have that power in their minds. That hardline attitude gave way within the first generation, and the Baptists were soon up there with the Methodists as the most enthusiastic adopters of hymn singing and hymn writing. Now, of course, this power to embed words and ideas in our minds means that it is important to pay attention to the quality of the lyrics. This can be an issue, particularly in the modern praise songs of the neo-Pentecostal or contemporary praise and worship churches, because in their liturgies, music serves a different function. It's more sacramental than instructional. That is, it functions to facilitate an emotional and spiritual experience of the presence of God. And that sacramental function means that it is the sound and feel of the songs and their ability to influence our feelings and experience that is more important than the words. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a perfectly good and valid thing but it does sometimes mean that the songwriters give insufficient attention to the quality of the words. And that matters because even if the words are not the primary focus, they are still being embedded in our hearts and minds. And that's a bad thing if they are conveying bad images of God. For example, there is a worship song that has been hugely popular in the last 15 years called Come, Now is the Time to Worship. It's a great piece of music and very enjoyable to sing in a big crowd. I love it. But it also explicitly teaches that the biggest rewards in heaven are kept for those who come to Jesus first. And that's a flat out contradiction of what Jesus himself said in his parable of the workers in the vineyard. But I've got no idea how many times I'd sung that song before I even noticed what it was saying and what it was impressing on my mind. So if you've wondered why we never sing it here, that's why. I hope you're not hearing that as a criticism of the style, though, because it's not. And it's not a criticism of choosing music for its emotional and social impact on us. That's always a factor in music, and it's only a problem if it's exploited to manipulate people unfairly or if it's not recognised and understood and so is working randomly and chaotically. Feeling good is almost always one of the benefits of singing together. Feeling good, feeling united, feeling affirmed in our common faith, feeling strengthened in our group identity, feeling strengthened in our common purpose, our shared mission. These are all good things that singing together contributes to. And these things really matter amidst the challenges of living faithfully and courageously in a hostile and divisive world. The gospel is all about these things. It is all about breaking down the walls that divide us and uniting the whole world as one beloved people in Christ. And as a simple tool, there are few things more effective 
in making people feel united and at peace with one another than singing together. Combine that power with good lyrics that proclaim a thrilling vision of God's love reconciling us all in a world made new. And it's no wonder that the followers of Jesus have been singing together ever since he first walked among us. As our reading from Ephesians frames it, it is a basic expression of being filled with God's spirit. And it is a normal means of collectively giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. But before I finish, I can't neglect the elephant in the room. Does any of this still work for us when all our liturgies are online and we're not physically gathered in a resonant room where we can blend our voices and feel the full energy of that. I'm not going to pretend that nothing has changed and nothing has been lost. To put it bluntly, we are now singing along to recordings and that can never perfectly replicate the experience of full gathered congregational song. But it's not 100% lost either. I've heard visitors to our worship service say that they are surprised by how much more real our singing feels than what they have experienced in online worship elsewhere. And they're often confused as to why. It's actually not that hard to explain though. It's because the recordings are actually of us and we are all singing along in real time. We're not singing along to recordings made by professional musicians or choirs. And actually, in some physically gathered churches, the music has become so professionalized that most people are doing little more than quietly singing along with something that has been take, totally taken over by the band or the choir anyway. Even our present experience may be more authentic than that. Because what we are here, because what we're hearing is actually us. It sounds more real and feels more real, especially if you turn it up loud enough so that you can sing with full gusto and blend in with the other voices that you're hearing. It won't work nearly so well if you've got the volume low and you just peep along. There have been studies that have shown that when people are singing together, their heartbeats begin to synchronize with one another. And because that's attributed to the structure of the music rather than the physical proximity, it's entirely possible that the same thing still happens when we sing together in this way online. If you get fully into it, the singing itself may be physically connecting us. If you love singing and you want to take it a step further than that, you could put your hand up to become one of the people who contributes their voices to those recordings. Just contact me and I will let you know how. It's not hard. I will be the first to admit that singing together this way can never be as good an experience as being in a community choir or in a physically gathered singing congregation. But as we have discussed before, there are lots of things we'd lose and people we'd lose if we went back to physically gathered worship. And that's life. You can never have everything and choices need to be made. And by all means, go and join a community choir too. <laughs> it doesn't have to be just one or the other. Be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs>